All right, welcome to this afternoon's uh, plenary session. So, um, I'm Jan Hesteven. It's my privilege to introduce uh, this afternoon's plenary speaker, uh, Professor Fen Yang Lee. Um, Fen Yang got her PhD at Brown in 2004. Um, spending four years at Brown, she wisely never took a class that I taught. Uh, <laughs> Um, nevertheless, she somehow made it and is now very successful. Uh, was just promoted to full professor at uh, RPI. Uh, in her career, she has worked a lot on linear and nonlinear way problems. Uh, in particular, in her thesis, she did some very well cited work on um, locally divergence free or structure preserving discretization using DG. And then in the last few years, where I have been writing a lot of letters for her. She has, so I know what she's doing. And she's moving into asymptotic preserving schemes for kinetics and other types of problems. Uh, so with that, please. Kind introduction. And uh, actually, thank you for all the letters as well. And uh, it's a great honor for me to uh, stand here to speak uh, today. And I will talk about asymptotic preserving discontinuous scalarity methods. So in the introduction, I will set up the problem. So we'll consider a linear transport equation in a diffusive scaling. Then uh, I will explain to you what make methods asymptotic preserving. Uh, after that, I will review discontinuous scalarking methods. Then I will examine the AP uh, asymptotic preserving property of the, the uh, classical oven DG method and uh, also a relatively new DG method based on a reformulation of the underlying equation. So in the end, I will summarize and conclude. So we're here considering uh, particle dynamics. So we just uh, imagine we have a collection of particles which is moving along a one-dimensional space. So all the particles will travel uh, with the same speed, V0. And uh, the particle, some will travel to the right, some will travel to the left. So if they are independent, we can just use uh, the advection equation to model this behavior. But suppose I also want to take into account the particles interaction with the media. So for instance, the particle can travel over a certain distance and they can scatter off the media and they can change direction. So in my current system, it's very simple. There are only two possible directions. The particle will switch direction. So uh, I here will use the model, uh, with, with use the term like uh, on the right hand side to model this interaction. So you can see the sum of this term is zero due to conservation. So I want to rewrite this a simple model a little bit, uh, so an easier extension. For instance, I introduce a new function f, which depends on not only uh, location x and time t, it also depends on velocity. Depends on velocity. When v is v0, uh, f is just alpha, then that's right-going particle. When v is negative v0, that's R, f is beta, that's left-going particle. So for convenience, we also have a function which is the angle bracket of f, which is a function only of x and t. So this you can see, this is a, essentially you integrate of the velocity. So that's like a x t function. So with that, the, uh, the dynamic can be written in term equation two. So on the left, you have a transport operator. On the right, you have the, I call the scattering operator. So I want to work with the dimensionless form of this model. So for that, I need to reference the time. That's the scattering time. So sigma is the scattering constant. <clears throat> so V0 is the velocity. So their product will define the mean free pass. That's the average distance for the particle to travel in order for them possibly switch direction. So using them, I can uh, uh, have a dimensionalized time and the velocity and the x variable. So I want to introduce one more. Uh, parameter, so this is a, a mean free pass over characteristic length scale. So uh, uh, the L here, uh, you know, the reference length scale I use is just domain size. So this is the nuisance number is dimensionless parameter. So think about the system when this epsilon is order one. So this is my domain size. The particle need to travel roughly comparable to this size to possibly switch direction. So the system will behave just like what we're familiar as a transport. So transport dominant the regime. However, if the epsilon is very small, so this is my domain, the particle just travel tiny distance, 
then the, the particle can possibly switch direction. So if you, you, you follow the trajectory, you're going to see a zigzag behavior. Particle travel forward, backward, forward, backward. So you can see this is no longer transport in nature. So it turns out in this regime, the system is diffusive. So to see that, I can do a scaling. I can do this diffusive scaling. I scale uh, x uh, by 1 over epsilon. I want to observe over longer time, I scale t uh, over 1 epsilon square. So, so they, they are here. So with this scaling, I will end up with equation uh, number 3. So, so I'm not carrying the tilt and the hat in my notation. So you can see uh, the dimensionless parameter epsilon will appear in front of time derivative of f and also appear in the scattering term. So I said this system will be more diffusive, but uh, you know, uh, we want to confirm this is the case. So this is actually can see uh, uh, analytically, for instance, uh, for this two velocity system, the model can be written in terms of alpha beta, can also be written in terms of this new quantity rho and j. So it's here in the equation four. So uh, this rho is more like zero's moment of f, and g is more like first moment of f in velocity. You scale it. So under this new unknown rho and g, you can see uh, you can see the behavior of both small epsilon a lot better. For instance, when epsilon is small, the second equation tells you g is just negative of spatial derivative rho. You plug this back in 5a, then you get a diffusive equation. That's the bottom of this page. So essentially, rho will satisfy more like a diffusive equation. So uh, I want to here uh, write a slightly more general, I want to consider a slightly more general model. So uh, we consider linear transport equation and the diffusive scaling with unknown f, which is a density distribution function or particles. So this function depends on position x, velocity v, and the time t. So sigma in general can be spatially variant. And uh, the scattering operator, I call it as, as L operator. So the operator will depend on this integral of f in velocity. So for that, you do need to measure in velocity field. And the operator, uh, notice, only act on velocity. So the null space is just one dimension for this simple model. So this will uh, come back to us uh, uh, when I talk about the method. So the epsilon is the dimensionless Nusen number. My starting example is the telegraph equation, or called Gold, uh, Goldstein Taylor equation, so which only involves two possible velocity, the sigma is a constant. And there's another well known example, uh, simple enough, called the one group transport equation in slab geometry. So this is a simplified model from really the transfer equations. And in this case, velocity can continuously take value from negative one to one. And uh, the measure we use is just the standard, the big measure, you scale it, uh, so you normalize it. For both cases, when epsilon is small, the equation has a diffusive behavior. For instance, the equation six here uh, gave you the limiting equation. You can see the scattering function will contribute to the diffusive coefficient. The kappa just depends on uh, the velocity variable. So rigorously speaking, this equation only valid uh, when it's away from initial and also the boundary, because your initial condition you have may not be compatible. So we'll call this as a non well prepared. In that case, you can have initial layer. And uh, uh, around boundary, if the boundary data depends on velocity, that's called anisotropic, then you can have boundary layer. Uh, this model is a one dimensional, but it can serve as a prototype model to study uh, quite uh, many uh, physically relevant models like neutron transport or really the transfer uh, equations. So in the uh, footnote, I also include a slightly more generalized uh, uh, case for the second example. So here I have uh, other effect like absorption, I have some source <coughs> term. So we here consider, uh, we, we concern how to solve this equation, particularly focus on method with asymptotic preserving property. Let me explain uh, what, uh, what's this property about. So on the continuous level, we have this equation which depends on parameter epsilon. We know when epsilon uh, approach zero, the model will c convert to a diffusive equation. This at least in bulk part of your domain. And suppose I have a numerical method. So the numerical method, I have a, a subscript delta to say this is numerical. That's like delta x or delta t. So the question we're asking, whether or not on a discrete level, this in this direction, uh, the scheme has a similar property as what we see on the continuous level. If the answer is yes, we see the method has a, a, a AP property. So uh, what we mean by it preserve the property on the, limit, uh, uh, on the discrete level? Well, I have two parameter epsilon delta. I'll fix my mesh, let epsilon go to zero. 
you want to see whether it has a limit. If it has, whether this limit is a good approximation for the limiting model. So that's how we make an AP method. So I do want to emphasize this is for under-resolved grid. You solve things on the mesh which is a lot bigger than the epsilon scale. So typically in numerical analysis, we look at this direction. We look at the vertical direction. We let mesh size go to zero. And now I have a commuting diagram. We have AP scheme. So this will provide another error, uh, another uh, error estimate. So combining these two, formally speaking, you can get the uniform convergence uh, result uh, uh, when delta go to zero uh, in term epsilon. So namely, that such scheme can work uniformly well for a broad range of epsilon. So there uh, has been a lot, lot of work in literature uh, in, uh, to study methods with AP property. I here only include very few references. The first two groups are for the linear transport equation in diffusive scaling and with the, the first gr group uh, for stationary problem. So in, in literature, you tend to see the method with AP is called methods with the thick diffusion limit. So so-called thick, namely your mesh is a lot thicker than the mean free pass, a lot thicker. And uh, the second group is for some time dependent uh, uh, model. So uh, like both work I said here depends on uh, the equation reformulation. And I here also re uh, include the several review papers. So this, uh, uh, like for instance, for Boltzmann equation, hyperbolic with stiff relaxation and fluid model in plasma mass. Uh, so why AP? So why, uh, when this method will be relevant? So, uh, so I actually like uh, the several paragraph from Marvin Adams 2001 paper. So he actually has some discussion in, in the setting ready to transfer equations. And uh, uh, I won't read all, but uh, he, he mentioned that commutational limitation for the use of spatial grids whose cells are often quite bigger compared with the mean free path. So, you know, it's understandable. You don't want to have your mesh size as, as, as small as the small epsilon. So, um, so in the relative transfer applications you encounter, you can have a setting of problem and the problem can involve many different materials. Like for instance, if you do sheeting application, you have different layer of materials. For different material, that will correspond to different epsilon. So it means you have spatially variant epsilon. And also, you can also have a system which involve particles uh, belong to different energy group. Again, those, if you translate to my uh, parameter epsilon, these also have a different size. So in other words, in this type of application, you want to work uh, on under-resolved grid and also at the same time, you can handle a, a wide range of epsilon. So that's exactly what AP method can address. So in this talk, I will just focus on high order uh, methods which has this AP property. Particularly, I only focus on this continuous scalarity method. So in the literature, you can see the method has been developed for almost any type of uh, framework of numerical method. So I will be very narrow. So when I talk about the methods analysis, I mostly focus on sigma x equal to one. But uh, uh, you, know, you surely can work for general sigma of x. So this is about AP and also the modeling equation. And now I want to review a little bit of this continuous scalarity method. I assume some of you working on like Reno methods. And uh, you can appreciate this. And I will start with model equation. This is a 1D scalar conservation law. So the U is your unknown. F uh, is the flux function. Then uh, we can partition domain into small elements, uh, the element called IGA and the, we can introduce uh, associated mesh, we can introduce a finite dimensional space, which is piecewise polynomial up, up, up to degree k. So we know the function like this has no global continuity. It has possibly two values at the grid node, and uh, we use the superscript to distinguish these two values. And the methods, uh, the formulation start with a weak form, and uh, they involve a test function w. So this is the weak form here, uh, over one element. Then formally you replace u, is which is exact solution, test function, by function from the discrete space. So I here consider dg only applied to space. And uh, to do that, we need to reinterpret the last two terms because they live at the grid nodes. Uh, we know all the functions here are double valued. So the test function, we can uh, always take information from within this element. And for the flux function, you can replace by this called numerical flux which depends on the numerical solution uh, taking value from both sides. So no surprise, this uh, numerical flux will play the crucial role uh, of the property of the scheme. So it will affect 
can affect the stability, accuracy, and also the implementation uh, aspects of the scheme. And uh, there are some minimum uh, properties uh, you need to impose, like consistency, a single value, et cetera. So I here have several examples. For instance, if you work with a linear advection equation, so this is one way wave propagation, so you can just follow the Aven principle to just uh, uh, get the Aven flux. You can also do a simple average that will give you central flux. And for the model equation, I put here this linear, uh, nonlinear hyperbolic conservation law. What's preferred is called the monotone flux. So this here on the bottom, that's a, a round uh, uh, example, Lax Friedrich's flux. So for the equations I'm considering in this talk, so all the operators are linear. So I focus on linear model. So I will say, when I say apply DG methods to, uh, to this equation, I essentially just provide a recipe to approximate derivative. So for instance, I here have a linear direction equation. So this bunch is uh, often DG discretization. And I reform it a few times, I reach uh, equation eight. So eventually I just get a discrete version of the spatial derivative. So these functions live in a discrete space. It depends on the space, the choice of the space. Also depends on the flux. If you change flux, change space, you get a different approximation. So uh, we know DG method have lots of nice properties, very flexible, and uh, it can be a formula as accurate as you wish, has a local conservation for free, uh, very compact, high parallel efficiency. So related to the uh, model I'm considering linear transport equation in diffusive scaling, uh, we like it in the sense that my equation can change type depending on the value of epsilon, but DG method is very flexible to solve different type of equation. You can easily uh, put them together in the same system, particularly since the underlying equations, it's a diffusive equation. If you have a PDE which has a higher spatial derivative, um, then we, we know there's a method called the local DG methods, which is based on the first order form of the equation. So this will uh, come actually later. So we know this method uh, already, and uh, we, we want to give it a try to solve this, uh, this linear transport equation in, uh, in diffusive scaling. So what's in this equation? You can see on this side is transport operator. On this side is something new, possibly new, but it does not depend, there's no derivative. So the first natural try is you apply affluent DG method. Uh, so here I'll give it a try, two velocity example, and uh, this is the exact solution. And I'll apply, uh, apply the piecewise constant case. In time, I just use a backward OLA method because the, uh, the, uh, the problem can be stable for small epsilon. So the first the plot is of an epsilon 0 0.5. So this is uh, uh, its order one, uh, transport dominant. And you can see the computed and the exact solution very close. However, if you uh, further reduce epsilon, then you can see quite a big uh, discrepancy. So this is, I uh, only have 80 elements. You can try to increase the number of elements. You have to put a lot, lot, lot of fun grid to, in, to see anything useful. To understand what happened, and I can write down everything about this scheme. This is a very simple scheme. I know this equation can be written in terms of rho and g, and I also know when epsilon is small, this is diffusive. <laughs> And also correspondingly write on the DG, often DG method. So this is the scheme in terms of rho and g. The terms in blue are the terms we know it's a numerical dissipation due to the often treatment. So this is okay when epsilon is order one. So that's when transport dominant. However, when you consider small epsilon, so I can uh, take the dubbing term in 9b, plug in 9a, I get this 10, equation 10. You can see Somehow, we have some problem with parameter epsilon where it appears because it appears in the wrong place. When epsilon go to zero, you don't see any other dispensation for the heat operator, but you only see this one. So that's a show that your limiting scheme is not consistent to the limiting model. So that confirms the scheme is not AP. So there are some remedies. So often DG method is pretty good. It cannot be so bad. It probably I've changed the uh, not so ideal version. It turns out if, uh, as I said, the, the method you can play with the space or play with the flux. For instance, you can use bigger space. You can use PK often DG method as long space is a, is a modern uh, con piecewise constant. Then you can get capture the correct limit. Or you can just say, I, instead of using a pure oven flux, I can use a scale dependent, scale epsilon dependent flux. For instance, in oven flux, you can write it as a central 
plus a, a, like a stabilizing term involves the jump. And if I, I put a weight here, the weight depends on epsilon. Particularly, I want to make sure that when the epsilon approaches zero, this will uh, uh, approach zero. So I want to have a smooth transition from oven to central. So it turns out that will work. For instance, I rerun the example with the scale dependent, uh, the weight in front of the jump, then you regardless what's my epsilon, I see the first order uh, accuracy. So it turns out oven DG methods under AP property has been intensively studied in literature uh, for uh, transport, uh, for neutron transport and radiative transfer equation, particularly for a lot of work for stationary problem. And we know the first DG work for hyperbolic problem uh, was done for neutron transport equation. This was done by Reed and Hill uh, in 1973. And uh, in early 80, Larson actually uh, uh, did a, a um, a somatotic ana uh, analysis for several different methods, including uh, several versions of DG methods. Particularly, he found if you work with a P1 DG method with oven flux, so this method will have the correct limit. And uh, however, if you was work with P size constant, the limit is wrong. So this is for 1D. And then Larson Morel in 1989 also looked into uh, if your system has a boundary layer. So it turns out DG method performed really well in that case. So again, this is for 1D. So uh, Adam in 2001 uh, uh, wrote a, a, a paper to look, uh, go beyond 1D. So he actually looked at 1D, 2D, and 3Ds, working with linear and bilinear often DG methods. We know once you go beyond 1D, the geometry, the, the, the shape of elements can be complicated. <coughs> then he discovered from his numerics and also his uh, asymptotic analysis, on some meshes, the skin does not have the correct limit. He also have some explanation uh, from his analysis. So his observation was rigorously approved by Guman and Kanshas in 2010. So this is, is like a numerical analysis type of uh, 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 work. So the, uh, the edges now go beyond uh, linear, so they, they go to general space. So uh, what happened is when epsilon approach zero, your scheme, your often DG method will, will approach to a mixed type of method, which is more like a local DG method. But for the primary variable, the variable has to live in, it's false to be continuous. So the continuous has to live in a continuous space. And hence your discrete space has to include a meaningful, like large enough, globally continuous piecewise polynomial space. We know you have to go start at least from linear. If you have complex meshes, then you have to really even have a higher degree polynomial. So this is for the space uh, aspect. And two years later, they actually also did the work to focus on the flux. They actually make the flux to be more skill dependent. So for all this uh, work I, I, I set on this page, and uh, you are going to have a linear system to solve. So I think I want to mention a few works on the solver. Uh, there's one very nice uh, review paper by uh, Adams and Larson. Uh, this is actually, re they reviewed the work from 60s. This, there are a lot of uh, solvers developed so this is uh, not particular for DG, but uh, the techniques are very relevant. For instance, the most fundamental techniques is uh, involving transport sweep and some source iteration, and also some uh, accelerated technique once you have a scattering dominant system. And uh, the, the second line, uh, second group uh, actually some works, a uh, solver work on, uh, for, uh, uh, for DG methods. So this involves multi-grid methods with gauss seidel steps with some proper orderings. I see Hong Kai is there uh, in the second row. So. Um, okay, this is about often DG method. The methods are proposed for the original equation, and uh, uh, if you do a somatotic type of analysis, you can understand their AP property. They work really fairly well. So now I want to switch to a new DG methods. Uh, this is methods based on pretty different framework. So instead of working with the original equation, we work with a, a reforming the form called macro macro decomposition. And in time, we'll apply implicit explicit Runge Kutta methods. We'll choose the uh, uh, implicit explicit strategy properly, such that the scheme will be AP. And also, it will give us a reasonable linear system to solve. And in, D, in space, I'll just use DG method. Let's look at the reformulation. So I here will consider uh, uh, L2 space in velocity with the most natural inner product. Then uh, recall that the scattering operator only act on V variable, uh, the null space is one dimensional. So it, it only includes a function which does not depend on V. 
Then I will introduce a uh, orthogonal projector, uh, pi, which is map any uh, f to the null space of L. So this is, you give me f, I just need to integrate off the velocity. So I have a function depend on x and t only. So with that, any function f can be decomposed orthogonal to two parts. Once the pi f, I call this rho, the remaining part is just uh, uh, essentially the remainder. I factor out an epsilon, so the remaining is called a g. So correspondingly, you can apply this pi operator and i minus pi to the equation, you get this decomposition. So this decomposition was uh, uh, originally used to study the PDE, uh, do PD analysis for the similar model. So from here you can see, well, you can see the diffusive limit a lot easier. For instance, just in like, in like the rule GS system for two velocity case. For instance, in 13b, if you uh, let epsilon go to zero, you're going to recover this called local equilibrium. So G will uh, relate it to Rho's spatial derivative. And you plug this back into a first equation, you see this diffusive equation. So this is very different from the original equation. Original equation, you have to do a asymptotic expansion to see the limit. So here you see it right away. So I here at this point, I assume the initial data is uh, compatible, it's uh, well prepared. So namely, my, the initial data I have is very close to equilibrium, local equilibrium. Uh, with respect to this parameter epsilon. So uh, in this case, I don't have initial layers in the problem, so then I will comment on uh, the, the other case later towards the end. So this is the equation. Now we look at the time. Uh, in time, I will, uh, at this point, I will focus on the first order in time. First order, I'll pick implicit, explicit. So to translate that's like I'll apply part of this backward Euler method, part will be forward Euler method. <coughs> So what's the strategy? So our strategy is for small epsilon, these two terms will be more stiff because those will be most dominating. We'll treat this uh, using backward Euler method, like uh, implicitly. So this term is a, a, a transport in nature. We treat it explicitly. So this term in principle can be either explicit or implicit. For now, we, we work with explicit uh, version because it, it will give us a more efficient uh, system to solve so for, because for the efficiency. So now, uh, if I formally uh, consider small epsilon, uh, this equation, will, the dominant term will be this uh, balance of this local equilibrium. And uh, then if you plug this back into the first case, then you get a, a forward Euler discretization for the heat equation, that's the limiting equation. So in space, we'll use a DG method. As I said, DG is just to approximate the derivative. So for the space, we'll use piecewise polynomial of up to degree K. And these terms come from transport. We use upwind strategy. And these two terms will appear after you let epsilon go to zero, appear in your final diffusive equation. Then you just need to think what will work for diffusive equation. And we know alternating uh, flux will work, central flux will work. So we, we uh, here just include the alternating flux. Namely, if you, you uh, 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 approximate the flux here from the left, then you approximate this one from the right of the node. So uh, uh, you can also use central flux uh, here. So once we know how to do in time, so here uh, it's a first order in time for now, and uh, in space we apply DG, which is formally ab arbitrary order. You can put them together, get a fully discrete scheme, we call DG MX1 at, at now. And from here I want to point out the cost. So if you know the solution at t, uh, nth time level, you first solve 17A, to get a row at the next time level. So this will involve inverting a mass matrix. And then uh, from here, since this term is known, then again, you, you can move this one to that side, you solve uh, mass, invert mass matrix. We know for DG method, mass matrix is either diagonal or block diagonal. I, I do want to mention, we have a very simple scattering operator. That's why like, uh, it's trivial to handle this uh, scattering term. So some theoretical results, I will state some results in terms of stability and accuracy and also the AP property. Particularly, uh, the stability is uniform with respect to epsilon, which is actually is quite crucial. For this model equation on continuous level, uh, we enjoy this uh, uh, L2 type of energy relation that says the L2 uh, energy does not increase in time. So this can be carried over to the numerical methods. Uh, although the energy we, we select is slightly uh, non-conventional, they stagger a little bit in time. And uh, under the time step condition, so uh, in upper bound, you see other than epsilon, that's the parameter, uh, H is the measure size, spatial measure size. 
You see some parameters, but they're all computable. So we know the size. They depend on polynomial degree k coming from inverse inequality. And uh, the key I want to show is the scheme is uniform stable with respect to epsilon. So that's uh, uh, the, the, the key property. And with that, then you can some, uh, combine some standard technique. You can get error analysis. Uh, so they will get the first order in time and uh, high order, so namely k plus one half order. So that's uh, this term in space. And surely if epsilon is small, you probably can get the one half back, order back. So now we want to see what will happen when epsilon is small, yeah, when epsilon approaches zero, so this asymptotic behavior. So first we'll look at everything on the formal level, then we, can, then we want to prove it. On the formal level, here is the uh, reformulated equation in rho and g. So this is the scheme. And everything uh, outlined in blue are the terms, they are like a, a formally dominating. So, uh, so when epsilon is small, they are like larger, so they are large. Then I will send epsilon go to zero, so essentially all the terms in blue will stay, so at least formally. And uh, here in the limiting equation, other than working with G, I work with the first order moment of uh, that I call it the Q. In that sense, you can see the limiting equation is just the first order form of heat equation. So that's the limiting equation. And the scheme here is a consistent approximation, a uh, discretization for this equation. Namely, it involves local discontinuous scalarity method in space and essentially forward Euler method in time. So this is uh, show that the scheme is uh, AP uh, except uh, with little subtlety uh, uh, around the initial condition, we do need a well-prepared initial condition to connect this Q with rho because you have two different formula for Q which come from rho and g. So for general data, they are not related, but uh, for uh, well-prepared, they are related. So in, in uh, overall, we can say if I have a good data, like well-prepared initial, the scheme is AP formally, so this turns out it can be proved uh, because we have uniform stability, everything can be done rigorously. So high order, so I only done so far the first order in time. So high order in time can be achieved by uh, implicit explicit RK methods, Runge Kutta methods. We know such method, uh, a one step method multi-stage and can be uh, represented by uh, this double butcher tables. So uh, in this uh, a framework, we actually uh, only work with a method that has two properties. <clears throat> the first one called globally stably accurate. Uh, it's essentially saying in my multi-stage multi, uh, method, the final inner stage will produce identical results as the full RK stage. That's the uh, globally stably accurate. So this can guarantee if I start with well-prepared initial, then my solution will always st stay close to the uh, local equilibrium, regardless at the full RK stage or the intermediate stage. So that's actually a very nice property. We also uh, require the implicit part, this is the implicit part of the butcher table. The, the matrix A has a sp specific uh, structure. So this uh, uh, is a, it's a method of type ARS. So such method can render a manageable order condition. So otherwise to achieve certain accuracy, you have to include a lot more uh, stages. So the first order scheme I talked about early on in time, it can be put into the table like this, and we also work on second and third order uh, case. So this is actually all available in the literature, so it's not all work. So uh, we carried out a formal symptotic analysis and the showing if we have a well-prepared initial, the limiting scheme uh, will be consistent, uh, consistent to the limiting equation. Uh, for instance, uh, particularly, uh, the limiting scheme involve our local DG method in space and involve explicit part of the IMAX scheme in time. Uh, as long as we go away from first order in time, we don't really know how to do energy type of stability analysis, so we carry out free analysis uh, to, to try to study the time step condition. So particularly, we combine a uh, case order uh, IMAX scheme with uh, in space, we use DG method with K minus one as a polynomial. So this is a formula like, more like case order in both space and time, if, you know, formally. So we look at K equal to one, two, three. What we find is when epsilon is order one, so namely your problem is transporting nature, we get a parabolic type time step condition. So I mean, delta is on the scale of uh, delta X, like that's H here. However, for small epsilon, uh, then you have a diffusive equation, you have explicit method, 
then we get parabolic type, uh, time, uh, uh, time condition. So this is a, a pretty rigid, but it's expected because we're working with explicit method. So next I'm going to show several examples, uh, three set of examples. The first one is uh, one group transport uh, uh, in slab geometry. So this is a smooth example, we want to do accuracy test. And uh, in this case, there's, uh, the initial data is well prepared. So the initial conditions were prepared, and uh, I only have one table here to show that if I apply third order MX in time and the quadratic DG in space, regardless of the epsilon, we get a third order accuracy. The second example, similar equation, but now the, uh, the, the problem involved two types of materials. So this is, uh, uh, will also have absorption effect. This is absorption effect. So the domain size is from zero to 11, and initially there's no particle. So particle just coming as a boundary data, this inflow, uh, uh, like uh, isotropic boundary data from the lab. So two materials, one pick up the, the, like the first unit, like from zero to one. So this is material, there's no scattering effect, there's only absorbing uh, a property. And the, the next 10 units from one to 11, you have a scattering dominant material, there's no absorption. So you can calculate what's the effect of the epsilon. You can see the left, you have one. On the right, you have 10 to the negative three. So essentially you have discontinuous effective epsilon. So and this we can regard as more diffusive. So for this one, we run over a long time. We collect the statistics. And uh, so there is a, uh, so essentially the information come in isotropically. Once you reach to the, uh, the end of the first unit, at the distance unit, so the solution become B dependent, hence there will be an inner layer developed. And we can fr freely use different mesh size. We use a lot of denser mesh here because it's deeper. So we use a lot of coarser grid on this side. So this can be all captured fairly well. So one more example is a Riemann problem for the two velocity example. So we want to check the performance when the solution, the data is non-smooth. So here we have a case uh, when epsilon is the other one. So that's the first column. So in this case, you know, it's a transport in nature. So we know transport, you, you carry the non-smoothness. So you can see the solution uh, have this uh, uh, discontinuity. So in this case, we didn't apply a limiter. This is, I think, informally, this is a, a quadratic polynomial in space and a third order IMAX in time. So no limiter, so the result's pretty good. So this side is epsilon small, the solution diffusive regime. It's very smooth, so you can easily capture it uh, quite well. So now I want to comment, what will happen if there is an initial layer? So uh, will our methods work well? So it turns out uh, it's no method to have some flaw uh, for that. So let's see uh, what's the problem. So recall the, I, we decompose f into two parts. Uh, suppose initially you are given a, like a, a nice f which is bounded, integrable, but then rho is the projection, it carry uh, over all the nice property, but the g can be uh, have this size can be big O of one over epsilon. Uh, then once you have that, that's initially, however, as long as you are away from uh, initial layer, initial layer, if you do layer analysis, is on, on the size of epsilon square. It's very tiny for small epsilon. As long as you're away from there, your rho energy, they are all, all the one. So however, our scheme is not doing what this PDE shows to us, uh, for instance, if you look at the first one, this is the root of the problem, if n is zero, so this term can be large. And uh, although you're supposed to be out of initial layer already after delta distance, but, uh, like, but you still have a large row. That's you really uh, have a wrong discretization. We have a wrong discretization. So, uh, so the, the intuitive fix is we, make, we should make it implicit. If we make it implicit, we actually bypass the initial G, then we use what in the next level. So we can do that, that works. And there actually, there is a simpler fix because this is actually Lamont Nielsen back in 2010 uh, have a proposed different implicit access strategy. They switch these two. So the key is you want to make sure uh, this one to be implicit. The reason we didn't follow this framework is because the solution does not sit nicely on the local equilibrium. So we want these two also sit on the same level. So that's why, uh, so the fix we here use is we just in the first two time steps we use what 
they have. And go beyond that, we'll use what we propose. So just a quick example. So we here have an example, then uh, the solution do have initial layer. And uh, uh, in this slide, the solid curve is the exact solution. So the dotted curves are coming from a computed solution uh, using formerly first, second, and third order scheme. So the error is fairly large. You think the error is almost order one. Then we use the more Mewson's type of implicit XP st strategy. So I should mention we're not increasing the cost. The cost is comparable. So we get a pretty clean uh, convergence order. So it means we don't, uh, uh, so we safely jump over the initial layer. So there are some other extensions of the idea we developed. Uh, we actually uh, apply the similar idea to uh, some uh, more general scattering operator, but from only for discrete velocity model. So there you can uh, uh, generate different limiting equation like advection diffusion, nonlinear diffusive equation, or Wisberger's equation. We also look at a different scaling, like for BGK model, if you work with hyperbolic scaling, the limiting equation will be compressed by Ola. So it will be become hyperbolic, so it's no longer diffusive. And recently, we also uh, uh, have some work to try to overcome the parabolic time step condition for small epsilon. Because the work I present so far, when epsilon is small, it's essentially like you apply explicit method for heat equation. That's, you definitely suffer from this condition. So what we, we, we managed to, to do is, if your model parameter is small with respect to your mesh size, this is some constant we can compute depending on polynomial degree k, the scheme is unconditionally stable. But surely you have to pay a price, right? So the price we pay is you just solve a standard person, uh, you invert a person uh, uh, operator using a local DG matrix, so associated with your spatial discretization. Uh, so we are not using, uh, inverting any other more complicated uh, operator, but just the person. So let me summarize and conclude. Uh, we here consider this uh, linear transport equation in uh, diffusive scaling. Then uh, we look into a somatotic preserving property for two type of DG methods. One's the classical uh, affluent DG methods. The other is based on reformulation. So these two methods based on different form of the model and uh, the design idea is different. Uh, for the reformulation case, you can see you in using your I, which term should be uh, related to the diffusive uh, limit. For the often version, you have to do a somatotic analysis, but often has very, very nice property, it turns out. And uh, the resulting linear system also rely on different type of solvers. So for the often DG, you, there has been a lot of study, uh, like in literature, to see how to solve those linear system. But for the one we designed, we can either need to solve a, uh, invert mass matrix, which is diagonal block diagonal, or to solve Poisson type of operator. So we assume that's also standard. So the methodology can be uh, more general, can go beyond the first simple model, uh, the first uh, uh, dimension model I have here. So the aspects we are not considering uh, uh, is uh, we, we didn't consider scattering operators with general uh, kernel. Uh, so this involves some fast inversion. Boundary layers not considered and uh, positivity. So we have quite several questions in terms of theory. We hope we can make a progress. And in the end, I want to uh, mention my collaborators. Uh, uh, so this work involves uh, Ying Da Cheng from Michigan State University. Zhu Hijiang is a PD person uh, in the University of Southern California. Zhi Chao Peng is my current third year PhD student uh, at RPI. He did all this initial fix, uh, initial layer, and uh, uh, overcome the parabolic time step condition. And Jing Mei Qiu from University of Delaware and Tao Xiong from Xiamen University, China. So I also want to thank all the support from Mass Institute and the, the NSF. Thank you. Thank you very much for an interesting and very clear presentation. Uh, we have time, since you are perfectly on time, we have time for a few questions if anyone has. Too suddenly. Okay. I, I was noticing it. So you're looking at the diffusive limit, which is um, um, uh, a limit where you it, you can move to a sort of slow 
it's a slow kind of singular right. limit in PDEs. Yes. Wondered if you had considered what happens with fast singular limits where oscillations are present, uh, but that there's an underlying low frequency to the, to I the case. I think that's a lot more challenging. Yeah. Yes. We have not. Hi, I was wondering if you'd given any thought to doing a fully implicit implementation of your um, macro micro decomposition. So actually that's an interesting question. So some effort we made, um, we actually have some effort, we actually make both terms implicit. So we find that can give a pretty good opportunity to achieve uh, AP unconditioned stability in diffusive uh, region. So we we'll actually still leave this term explicit. Uh, this is a transport term. So we didn't think of the fully implicit because we don't want to rely on uh, the solvers we have to read a lot of papers about. So now we only need to solve Poisson and also invert nice matrix. Anyone else? So the, <laughs> so the, um, the accuracy in time for the asymptotic solver was first order, right? Uh, so it's for, uh, we, we go from first, second, and third order. Let's use the uh, IMAX RK with high order accuracy. In the asymptotic limit? Yes, they are, th they are high order. They are the explicit part of your IMAX scheme. So if you start off with a high order, then you keep the explicit part of the IMAX scheme. So my analysis, so far we only know how to do a rigorous analysis, which is first order. Uh, so so the heat equation, the explicit part becomes exactly the um, solver for the heat equation? That's right. With, with a, a normal CFL condition that one would expect? Say it again. So the constants, the CFL constant, or the time step restriction is exactly the constant that one would expect for the heat equation, the naive? That's right. So for the okay. bulk part of my talk, because uh, essentially, uh, it's explicit in nature, so we get this par parabolic type of time step condition. But our recent work, the work I mentioned, uh, I think some work I mentioned here, so we try to get rid of that by paying a cost. If we're willing to invert a Poisson operator, we can get unconditioned stable for small epsilon. Okay, thank you. All right, anyone else? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll move it down. Nobody in the corner? <laughs> okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.